our special speaker today is going to be Christopher Chacon. He is a parapsychologist, a ufologist, supernatural and occult expert, um, and he's a scientific investigator of paranormal phenomenon. Um, Christopher, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Before we jump into questions from our, our um, attendees. I'd love to see if you could give us a little background about how you got involved and became an expert in this particular field. Well, it wasn't my intention, uh, by no means. Uh, uh, and it started many, many, many years ago uh, when I was in college. Um, uh, actually, I paid my way through college as a magician illusionist. So uh, and this was way back in the days when Doug Henning was still touring his show. And, and David Copperfield was. And I was approached by somebody who said that their house was haunted. And most magicians um, are, I guess you could say sensitive to the fact that, that they understand how people can misperceive events and think something is supernatural paranormal when there's a rational explanation behind it. Um, but what had happened is, is after helping these people explore what was happening there, I began to get a variety of different people coming to me with haunted houses, uh, different types of psychic phenomena. And that kind of swayed me in college to explore parapsychology and get educated um, and trained in parapsychology. And that kind of took me in a whole different direction. And with another parapsychologist, we began taking on uh, thousands of cases, everything from near-death experiences to UFO encounters. Uh, and I did that for over a decade. And then I was recruited by a scientific um, consulting company up in Silicon Valley to explore anomalies. And in that realm, I was trained as an anomalist. And with a bunch of other scientists, we basically traveled all over the world investigating thousands of cases of phenomena, uh, everything you could possibly imagine that deals with the supernatural paranormal. It would be hauntings and poltergeists, possessions, witchcraft magic, uh, encounters of miracles, divine intervention, strange creatures, anything you can imagine that's typically considered um, the paranormal supernatural is considered an anomaly. So we, I investigated those and that kind of took me in another direction. And then after I left that group, for the most part, I've been exploring or dealing with these uh, phenomena as a consultant. And where when phenomena is happening in different parts of the world, I'm brought in to give my, uh, I guess you could say interpretation of the phenomena and add assistance. I never charge for what I'm doing in different parts of the world. They just have to fly me there and I give them my, my feedback on the case. Uh, that pretty much brings it up to where we are today. And I, again, it was my, not my intention for me to do this. It was kind of snowballed that way. My God, you're like a real life ghostbuster. <laughs> Okay, well, we're going to jump into some questions because I know everybody here is fascinated by this topic and they probably all have a slew of questions for you. So our first question is going to come from Amy Fulcher from As the Bunny Hops. Amy, what have you got for Christopher today? Hi, Christopher. I am Hi. so excited to talk to you because I was the kid who grew up reading all of those true life ghost stories and all the books about the unknown. But I was always kind of bummed that I never had any experiences myself. I never got to really see anything. I was like, oh, I think that was a ghost or I think that was a spirit or something. Um, do you just feel like you're naturally more in tune with the paranormal or is there something that kind of makes people vibrate in a certain way that makes them more prone to having those experiences? That's a really good question. I think, you know, there was a lot of research done on if uh, certain people are have certain, uh, whether they be innate qualities, uh, or various types of what we call psi abilities. It's psi is a, a parapsychological word now we use for all types of psychic phenomena. Um, and you know, in short, there, there doesn't seem to be an, a, one you know, uh, element that exists in everybody that sort of more some compelled to have an experience or not. Um, you know, it, to some degree, it's almost, uh, not that we want to want you to get hit by lightning, but to some degree, it's kind of like the same thing when we're regarding uh, randomness of if you ever encounter a, a paranormal event that's happening. Um, most paranormal or supernatural events happen at, and we kind of, because of the our world we live in, um, we're all stretched sometimes very thin doing other things and we don't even recognize when the phenomena is happening. An interesting product of the pandemic is you know, all over the world, 
things have been switched up where places that used to be packed with people are now empty and no, no one's stirring in it. And we've encountered unusual phenomena happening in these places that are usually packed with people. And it still happens, even though people are there, but there's so many movements of people, no one recognizes it. So an event may have happened um, to you at some sort, some type of whether it could even be a psi event, you know, the phone's ringing and you know before it rings, it's about to happen, you know who's on it. Um, and and it, it's just, you know, not that it becomes mundane, it just kind of gets lost in the static of the world we live in. Thank you so much. Wow, sure. it's so interesting and it makes complete sense. Um, our next question is going to come from Candy Olivares from Candy Palooza. Hi, Christopher. It's wonderful to meet you. It's Hi, super Candy. interesting. So what you do, um, when it comes to the films that you have worked with, um, what is it about the scripts that, um, that, you know, that get you excited or is there anything that you, um, you know, that you kind of get a feeling about when it comes to the scripts as you're reading them? Well, you know, I mean, it's uh, certainly when I'm reading, just like when, you, when you're reading a book, you, you want to get, even though if I'm asked to explore something from the scientific technical aspect, I want to fold into the story just like anyone else would want to. So, you know, if there's great characters, great plot, great story to it, that, that certainly helps in understanding what the phenomena is. Mm -hmm. um, and often when I'm asked to, to give my two cents on something, I can't help but contribute regarding those things as well, like anyone would. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the thing that seems to compel me more is, is when I often encounter in a story, a, a phenomena or situation, which I've encountered in real life. Um, you know, it's interesting how much fiction really does imitate real life. There's all types of different phenomena that happens um, in real life that if you, if you take them apart, if you take about most movies uh, and take the phenomena and kind of dismantle it, there are reports of something like that having occurred someplace in the world. Um, and of course in a movie, they want to make it as dramatic as possible to condense all those phenomena in one story. But um, you know, it, the imitation of what really happens out there, uh, I think people would be really surprised. Um, it, it, sometimes it's even hard I think for most people to believe on some of the cases I have, especially the one I'm thinking about in a third world country I was recently at where it, you know, it's extraordinary that it didn't get on the press or media, but simply because it was of that extraordinary nature, no one would have taken it seriously. And in most of the cases I do, they don't. We avoid the press or media because we're dealing with people who are sometimes really traumatized. So if there's a, a certain degree of confidentiality involved, but uh, I think that's the biggest, one of the biggest elements I get when I'm looking at the stories is how much they do kind of mirror actual events. That's awesome, thank you. Great, our next question is gonna come from Susie Bellarte from Happy Mess Moments. Hi, Christopher. Hi. Uh, so I am very sensitive with these things. Uh, my parents are from Bali, so it's known as the island of, of the gods and demons. So sure. a lot of stuff when I was there and I, <clears throat> With my two boys, I've noticed that they're also sensitive. They've seen things, they've felt things. So because we can't call the Ghostbusters, what do you suggest, you know, dealing with presence? Like sage, I mean, we sage the house uh, for certain energies. Uh, do you talk to it? Do you, I've heard you put a calendar. So if there is a presence to see like, hey, it's 2022. So they know, hey, they don't belong here anymore. So, or do you ignore them? How do we go about that? Oh, that's that's a that's a uh, that's a difficult question because the answer is very broad. Um, uh, I have found that um, many of the the truths that we hold to that people have had, even culturally, whether it be culturally or I mean, connected to religious beliefs, um, uh, different parts of the world, they 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 hold true to them, but they don't actually the truce regarding the phenomena doesn't actually align. Uh, for example, uh, sage and other methods of cleansing uh, for, for lack of a better word, bad energy, um, doesn't actually does just the opposite. Uh, there are some beliefs, uh, ancient, uh, ancient archaic cult beliefs in practitioners who say elements of sage and stuff like that actually attracts entities that are dark, um, which is totally, 
counter to an, other beliefs. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing you have to think about is if these phenomena exist, they're not, they're not held contained within borders of different countries and different cultures. So sometimes you're going to encounter a phenomena which follows an entirely different belief system or criteria that's not even of that realm. Uh, I'll give you one example. There was a South Pacific island that was at for a phenomenon. And the archdiocese had been doing an exorcism that had gone on for like three or four weeks. And the poor subject at that point, they had almost practically chained them to inside of a clearing of a forest because it had been ripping uh, um, sticks and plants out of the ground. Um, it had been gouging and mutilating itself. And they, everyone was trying to understand why this thing is doing this. And the exorcism wasn't working until finally, when they brought me in to assess it, I wanted to try an entirely different approach. And I brought in somebody uh, who's commonly referred to as a clever man from the Australian Aboriginal Indigenous belief system. And uh, as soon as he got there, an entirely different interpretation took place. And within five to 10 minutes, the person was relieved of what had happened to them. And the, what we took away from that was that there's a matter of misinterpretation of these phenomena. And while the Roman Catholic exorcist was interpreting this person to be possessed by a demon, uh, the thinking was that he was actually uh, possessed by an animal, like a jaguar of some sort, a cat. And if you take any cat and you put a cage around it, it's going to want to rip away. It's not meaning to be evil or malevolent. It's just trying to get out. So this thing was trapped in a person trying to get out. And all that needed was somebody to sort of look at it with a different perspective, try to understand that perspective. And then they were able to let the thing go. So misperceptions, misinterpretations is so common with these phenomena. It's just like in everyday life, especially with masks on, everyone's wearing masks and it's so easy to misinterpret if someone's smiling <laughs> or if they're frowning or if they're happy. And the same thing happens with a lot of these phenomena. Thank you. Sure. That is fascinating because I feel like, I mean, again, I saved my house and my daughter is actually very sensitive and we've done all of what you would think is typical only to hear that you say it could be engaging with things well, <laughs> that you don't want to engage with anymore. Well, there's nothing. And again, I, I'm, I totally support if, you know, individuals following their belief systems is very important because you do manifest a degree of your reality uh, that happens around you. And whatever, every belief system, whether it be religious or not, has their own method of kind of, uh, balancing the energy around them, trying to clean their element around them. And that works. That really does work. But, uh, you also have to be mindful that, uh, you're not separate from the rest of the world, that obviously these things are, are moving, you know, there's an ebb tide to it. So that, that doesn't mean things that, that could sort of penetrate or enter area doesn't, wouldn't happen. It's very rare for it to happen, but it does in fact happen. Wow, oh, so interesting, so enlightening. Um, I know we have more questions. So our next question is gonna come from Megan Cooper from John Monkey. Hi there. So in a previous interview, you had mentioned that you have tried countless times to actually get out of the paranormal business at, at certain points in your life. So what is it that kind of like claws you back in? <laughs> uh, yes. Um, you know, I think <laughs> the, the main reason I take the, 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 the consulting I do, um, and when people bring me in, and again, I never charge for that. The, it's the whoever the client is, they fly me to that part of the world and I get there. The main reason I take those are not necessarily now for the phenomena. It's because they're telling me that there's people involved that are severely traumatized or been injured by the phenomena. And, you know, ever since I started doing it separately years ago, aside from parapsychology and my, when I was with the scientific group, um, there's a degree of when I help somebody deal with their experience. You know, I walk away from at least there's something I did because a lot of these phenomena, there's really nothing you can do, especially if it's after the after the fact. Um, and when I get there to, to borrow a psychotherapeutic term, I help normalize their experience because quite often after it happens, uh, extreme dysfunction happens. They can't go to work the next day because or the life has changed because this phenomena happened that doesn't supposed to exist. 
And the feeling that I get that I'm able to normalize it and put some stability is very gratifying. And I guess to some degree that gratification <laughs> has, has diminished because of the exhaustion from simply dealing with that amount of trauma every weekend. Uh, and I think, you know, it's while I'm dwindling the cases down, the reports I get like a, a hundred different calls at any one time from different parts of the world for consultation. Um, it, I, I'm still pulled back in a lot of times when I hear about families that are dealing with situations. And I, it's, it's really that element of wanting to help. And maybe that, that's a little bit of my own. Um, I was raised by very strong women. So they're always saying, hey, if you can help somebody, help them. I guess it's kind of intrinsic to who I am type of thing. That's wonderful to hear that you're helping so many. I hope you have a really good therapist. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Megan. Our next question is going to come from Kathy Cupkit from Live with Kathy. Christopher, thank you so much for being here. So my childhood home, we had um, spirits living with us. It was on, I'm not going to say the address of it, but it was on Deanwood Drive. And the, my parents had bought the home and the husband and wife had passed away of old age. And they lived with us. We would hear, you know, the staircase, somebody would be walking on the staircase or we would hear noises in the attic. Or it, what was interesting was that we would be downstairs and all of a sudden the entire family would hear right? Like someone was walking and we just kind of look up and go, okay, they're back. And so it was, it was from there that I believed as a child that spirits do live with us. And my mom is very in tune to that as well. I wanted to know what is your most memorable paranormal experience? Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> that's a very uh, tough question. Um, you know, Unfortunately, well, I mean, you know, the, the most, some of the most memorable ones are the ones where I first encountered when I was um, just getting started exploring phenomena. So as a parapsychologist, it would have been back in college when I was just training in parapsychology. When I was an anomalist, it was when they first trained me and I'm, I'm going in there as a young person and they're all older scientists studying something and you're not knowing how to react to something. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's a very different thinking. But I think overall, the Unfortunately, the cases that I remember the most are the ones where the trauma was the most severe for the people involved. People were animals. And, you know, you, you, you know I, I feel for those first responders who get to situations and then they have to, you know, go home at the end of the day and still deal with that kind of element that they deal with. And for these phenomena, it's, kind of, it's definitely the same kind of situation. Um, you know, and, and going back to your, the, the haunting experience you have, you know, I think um, most hauntings, that kind of phenomena are benevolent. They're, they don't mean there's no harm. And sometimes they're what we refer to in parapsychology as a residual haunting. There's actually nothing there. It's almost like a videotape replaying itself. And like TV, you know, you can hear the sounds, see the images, but there's no intelligence there. It's just a tape playing. And you're sensitive to it. Um, and in some cases, you know, these hauntings are even, in fact, mo most of the cases, they're subjective. They're not objective. The phenomena is almost happening at a telepathic level, which is why if you try to record something, you can't because it's all happening on a sensory level. Um, where I'm broadcasting right now from is a home where the people have actually been driven out of the home because something they say comes in and actually is more forceful. It pushes them down, holds them down. They could be sitting all watching television suddenly as if something grabs on the back of the head and pushes them all down to the ground all at once. And their, their dog here, they said, is, the, is sort of the trigger to it. It starts barking. And, it, and she, they said it's very reminiscent of the movie in Poltergeist, the dog's barking, one of the first scenes the dog's barking mm -hmm. at something for no reason. And then moments later, this phenomenon comes in. Um, so they basically moved back into one of their relatives' house. And so I'm here now. I've been here for like... Uh, only about eight hours now wow. trying to see what this phenomenon is to help them figure it out. But these are the rarest cases where they're actually a physical manifestation that happens. That's amazing. No, no, no. The, 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 I, I, we always call it the people, our friends. They were, it was, it wasn't harmful at all. Like they were just, they were good spirits. You know, we, my mom told us that they just they were old and they passed away in their home. Mm. And she always told us they just wanted to stay. So we had, you know, tenants <laughs> so, but it was really cool it would freak cool. our friends out my brother and i we would have friends over 
and they're like, what's, they thought we had rats in the attic and they were like, what's going on? And we were just like, no, 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 it's just, you know, friends, don't worry about it. <laughs> so but yeah, thank you. Sure. I hope you can help this family. It sounds terrifying. Um, we have a couple more questions. Our next sure. question is gonna come from Jennifer from Real Mom of SFV. Hi, nice to meet you. This is so fascinating. Hi, um, hi. I was wondering, could you describe a little bit uh, what your experience working on a set, uh, whether it's TV or film, um, maybe in particular with Dan Ackward on PSI Factor? Wow, uh, yeah, Sci Factor was a great experience. Um, Danny was involved in every capacity of it uh, from when we would sit down and write or pick the stories for the episodes. Uh, he was involved when we were developing it and, and, and producing it. His brother Peter was, was integral to the creation as well. We would all work together on it. And the, the, the great thing that, that we would have is discussions because um, um, Dan and Peter, of course, they grew up in a home where their parents would do seances. And uh, they're, they're, they had family that was very much into spiritualism at the time, which is one of the reasons Dan wrote Ghostbusters is because of that, that whole experience of, of sort of the acceptance of ghosts, that it's, um, you know, in, in the Western culture, ghosts are kind of not necessarily accepted when it has other cultures around the world, it's, well, it's just ghosts, it's, you know, it's, it's not separate from our world, they're all part of the same thing. And they were very much embracing that when he wrote Ghostbusters. Um, and uh, so he added a lot of those personal kind of attributes to how people should experience the, the phenomena when we were writing scripts. Um, he was also uh, integral in when we would actually shoot the scenes that he would discuss about the different phenomena people would experience in, in every episode. We had ongoing characters that were exploring phenomena and his feedback on it was really great to make them more human and how they respond because it's true a lot of sometimes writing or direction um they wanted people to react a certain way but people in real life don't react to phenomena the same way they all, quite often a lot of people kind of like deer in headlights they want to process first like is that really happening um something called cognitive dissonance happens and especially for people who are skeptical of phenomena if it happens they kind of, the brain doesn't know how quite what to do with it, kind of shuts off a little bit and even recognize, not dismisses it, no, that never happened and it didn't happen. Um, so those kind of sort of personal aspects are really great for the storytelling we did. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question from Angela Camacho from Queen Bee Latina. Hi, Christopher. Thank you so much Bye. for having me. I am actually, I think I'm a sensitive as well. And I had an experience in Northern California. Um, I actually spoke, spoke about it on a podcast called Supernatural Travel. Um, but what, what you do is absolutely fascinating. And um, I wanna know as an expert, what kind of role did you play on set with this film? Well, with Ghostbusters Afterlife, mm -hmm. um, I wasn't uh, involved with that creation. They, I mean, they, I, I'm involved now because of my relationship with Danny and of course regarding the phenomenon mm -hmm. that we discussed, but I mean, it was, and for a, very, a lot of good reasons, um, the writer director kind of did it in a vacuum. And it's good that he did because, I mean, for all of you who've seen it, of course, it's a great sort of the next step from the original Ghostbusters. You could get, kind of get the two and bookend them because it takes the story to the next level and completes it from the, from the original right. Ghostbusters. Right. And I think he purposely did that in a vacuum because he wanted to maintain those, those elements to keep it you know, very heartwarming as it is and yet keep it uh, close to the original narrative. Um, in the original, uh, certainly a lot of the research that, that Danny put into the story, and he, he was obviously speaking with the writer director for this one as well, comes from research that parapsychology is what we actually do and what, and what we've been trying to do to investigate phenomena to analyze it with instrumentation um mm -hmm. to be able to interact with it uh you know <laughs> in, in the original ghostbusters when they encounter the first ghost in the library their feedback is to get them you know the jump of the ghost that's okay. not usually something that we do but you know it makes it way more fun their comical interpretations um but a lot of the tech 
is there. You know, amazingly enough, you know, they use these proton packs, which is next generation super technology. We did, in fact, as anomalous, use next generation advanced technology. We had a portable linear accelerator that we did use to experiment with when we're encountering a phenomenon in the environment to see how it reacts. So there is a lot mm -hmm. of fun play with that type of technology. I love that. Thank you. Sure. Great. Before we go, we have a couple more questions from, um, from our friends here. Candy sure. has another question for you. Candy? Hi, Chris Ruse. So um, I've had friends tell me that, you know, they've had um, encounters and, um, and they have felt that the spirits have stayed with them and that it's taken a few hours for, you know, for the feeling to go away. Is there some truth to those types of feelings? And is that, do you feel that that's possible? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, I mean, clearly the first thing that anyone needs to do when they have any kind of an experience, you have to rule out, there could be another rational explanation for it. Um, but after you rule those out, if the phenomena is still happening, there's also psi phenomena, which is another parapsychological term for psychic phenomena. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, individuals that are telepathic or empathic, not aware of it, they could be walking along and suddenly they feel like crying, not realizing the person right next to them is crying and they're picking up stray emotions because they're empathic. Okay. Uh, or if they're telepathic, they're picking up thoughts from someplace else and they think, you know, it could be a spirit near them sending them thoughts or things like that. So there's psi phenomena, which explains it. Mm -hmm. As far as spirits actually following people, there's a variety of different types of haunt poltergeist phenomena, which does do that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's difficult to ascertain exactly how they do it. I think the question is, is the first thing they have to do is kind of not misinterpret things and not, you know, rush to conclusions regarding what it could be. There are a lot of cases where people were complaining of ghosts and it actually was a loved one just trying to protect them. Um, and they misinterpret someone looking over their shoulder because they like their space and they could feel that presence. So I think the biggest thing is, you know, again, not rush to conclusions to try to have an open mind to the possibilities of what it could be. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. Sure. You goose have, sorry. <laughs> I know, so interesting. We have one more question before we let you go, Christopher. This is gonna be from Megan again from John Monkey. Okay. So I love folklore and you know old stories that are passed down through multiple generations. So do you feel like in your experience traveling all over the world and things like that, that a lot of these stories are similar or the same kind of you know, whether it's ghosts or things like that, that are just kind of transcribed into this, this different experience or, or story over cultures or tribes and things like that? Uh, there's actually a yes and no answer to that because yeah, I mean, you could find, for example, uh, a really good example is um, this entity uh, which uh, is in mythology around the world, different cultures that basically takes the form of your worst fear. In Harry Potter, they call it a boggart. <laughs> you know, in, uh, in the um, Mesoamerican areas, it's called El Kukui, which tr changes form again. Um, you know, some, sometimes they say it hides under the bed or in the closet or sh sh it shapeshifts basically to your worst fear. And, and so I think a lot of times historians have a tendency to conflate and say, well, it was brought over from this ship or came over from this place, but from the thousands of investigations I've done and exploring into these, especially from an, from an archeological standpoint, I'm finding out that no, they're, they're actually, they're not the same thing. There, there is subtle differences and they're unique, just like we are unique in different parts of the world. Um, sure, sure, there are similarities, but as far as their origins and how they react under certain circumstances, I think they are individualized. Uh, uh, certainly, there are certain certain there are a couple of phenomena which are global and how people react to them, um, or how they manifest. But I think for the most part, there's a lot of um, these myths, or the the elements that are myths. The truth behind them is unique to whatever the experiencer had in that particular region. If that answers the question, I'm not sure that's clear. It does. There. Yeah, and okay. this is absolutely fascinating. So thank you. Sure. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Christopher, I think we can all agree that this was probably the most fascinating conversation we've had in a very long time. Oh, I'm glad. Um, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for helping out on Ghostbusters Afterlife. It, it does feel like a modern day storytelling of the original and it felt very real and very authentic.